Hello, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Hello, Caribbean. Hello, world. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Page Turners Plus. Today, we're going to be discussing Elizabeth Nunez's novel, No Lila Knows. To start us off, Francine will give us a short bio and synopsis of the novel. Hello, everyone. Uh, now Lila knows, in Now Lila Knows, Lila Bonnard has left her island home in the Caribbean to join the faculty as a visiting professor at the Mayfield College in a small Vermont town. On her way from the airport, Lila witnesses the fatal shooting of a black man by the police. It turns out that the victim was a professor at Mayfield. The rest of the book takes us through what happens in this community and how all the different characters in this small university town reacted to, to and were affected by this fatal shooting. Elizabeth Nunez, the writer of the book, is the award-winning author of a memoir and nine novels, four of which have been selected as New York Times editor's choices. She's the co-founder of the National Black Writers Conference and executive producer of the City College University of New York TV series, Black Writers in America. Nunez is a distinguished professor at Hunter College, where she teaches courses on fiction writing and Caribbean women writers. Now, let's start off. Um, I'm going to throw a question out to the panel. Why do you think the writer linked her experience, well, the experiences of the protagonist, the main protagon protagonist, Lila, uh, a college professor in Vermont, in the United States, with the experiences, the, the neo-colonial um, experience of, of the Caribbean. Thank you for that, Paula. But originally looking at it, um, I was slightly confused as to why she did that. Um, but then as, you, as the novel developed and as you read further into the novel, I think she was trying to draw parallels between the, the, the Caribbean situation and maybe the awareness of Lila as a sort of naive character and her experiences in the US. Because in some ways it didn't seem that Nyla was very or Lila was very aware of <clears throat> the depravity of the neocolonial situation in the Caribbean. And even through her um, relationship with Robert, it didn't seem that Nyla as a university professor was very aware of the struggles that that people in the Caribbean had um, in a sort of post-colonial slash neo-colonial society. Whereas in the United States, um, although you could say that the, the colonial situation in the United States ended centuries before Lila arrived, um, much of the situation in terms of um, Black relations and Af African-American um, relations in the U.S. Um, didn't change too much. So I think Nunez was trying to show a parallel. Did I fully grasp the parallel? I wouldn't say so, but I, I see where the effort was made to do it. But I'm wondering if she wasn't aware. Certainly she was aware intellectually. Um, because she comes from a privileged background, she didn't suffer the disadvantages of neocolonialism the way somebody who was, if somebody who is poor uneducated would have suffered it. I, I think she knew intellectually, she understood it. Um, I think it's just emotionally, perhaps, um, you know, it, she's, she's upper middle class, she's well educated. So I, I, I think it was that kind of disconnect. Um, I don't it, know if anybody else has any other thoughts on is that. It, is it that Layla gets a baptism um, for the Eric's and the Kessawas on the panel will tell you about the born again experience, right? Is it that Lila knows but forgot and got this reawakening? Um, so it's somewhere in her consciousness that, yes, there is oppression of black people, there is subjugation of black people, and so on in, in, in this near colonial setup. But having graphically uh, witnessed um, the manifestation of 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 that in the murder that um, Francine spoke about in the synopsis, um, is it that was the jolt or the beginning of the jolt? Um, I'm I'm throwing that out there. I don't know. Um, 
I struggled a little bit with uh, this idea that Lila is this, at the, on the one hand, university professor of literature, I believe. Is I, did I imagine that she teaches literature? Yes, she's, she, she was a literature teacher. So she's a teacher of, of literature from the Caribbean and somehow manages to be naive when if anybody in the Caribbean has written about neocolonialism, it's literature, right? It's fiction writers. So I, I, I struggled a little bit as that as a, as a believable thing. I do think um, there's no two ways about it. The opening of this novel is grabbing, compelling, shocking um, and powerful. Um, and for any prospective reader, I, I would highly recommend even just the first hour, uh, the first, um, I read, I listened to it, you can tell, the first um, opening for that reason, because it does grab you. It's certainly a, a very exciting beginning and shocking. Um, I don't know that, um, and, 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 she, and she places it well, right? Before she's even put her luggage down, before she's even arrived at her accommodation, she's confronted with the most brutal realities of American racism. Um, and she's just arrived literally off the boat or off a plane in this case. But I, I, I struggle with the idea that she comes from a position of complete naivety, though. That in that sense, it feels, and I, I'm, I'm going to use it and I hope people are going to kill me for it, but it does feel a bit dated, right? Like, I, I, as a British person, like, this this speaks a lot to my understanding of Windrush narratives of they didn't know it was going to be like this when they got there. But this is 2022, three now. Like, no one thinks that, like, you haven't been overexposed to American stories through media, through TV, through film, through even hip-hop music, right? So that naivety, I think, is misplaced and, and, and quite difficult to believe, is mm. what I would say. I am not sure that it is so misplaced, you know. Um, upper middle class Caribbean people will, I think often, I don't know, Tony, perhaps, because the, Tony and I live in the Caribbean. I thought you were calling the I know class. people. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I think I know Lila's. In, um, the fact that she's a literature teacher does make it a little more improbable. Right. That but, was, um, that one... But there is, I, 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 know pe I know Lila's to this day who um Car caribbean people who live the privilege of being light-skinned and middle class and think that is somebody else's problem that's not our problem um i don't know tony am i am i, I wrong you're largely accurate paula let me tell you the impression i got throughout the novel um i am more or less sort of vicariously um living Elizabeth's narrative, right? So I'm seeing the author being exposed to the very people that you are describing, Paula, who are in this sort of bubble. Um, and there's a lot of naivety in that bubble, partly because they don't want to get outside the bubble because it's, it's, it's softer in there. You know, you don't have to get out and deal with the realities so you know that as you peep out you know there are things going on but let's just contain ourselves and i think the author was sort of trying to expose um those people you know um she she encounters them on a daily basis she knows them just like how paula knows these letters elizabeth knows these people and she's trying to do an expose in this novel get out your bubble get out your your comfort zone and understand what it's like to be black, what it's like to be a black immigrant. People are not just making up these things. These are things that happen on a daily basis. So I, I, I see where she's coming from, Kesel. All right. That leads me to another question. Who do you think the audience of this novel is? Um, mm. who would I, Eric, would you like to give that a try? I can give that a try, Paula. Thank you. Um, yeah, reading the text, um, I was thinking about the, the audience uh, throughout. And definitely since um, Professor Nunez is, is based uh, in, in the United States, has been based in the United States for, for a long time, uh, it, it would seem as though the, the audience would be um, a, a majority American audience, either African-American, or um, black in a general sense in terms of um, uh, different communities of, of immigrants who come from the Caribbean and even, and even the continent of Africa. Um, but as, as I finished it, 
I really think the target audience was more suited to uh, both a Caribbean audience in general, but also that Caribbean, that Caribbean American audience who will have certain types of, 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 of ways of thinking about the United States, but also thinking about their African-American cousins. And I think she's trying to, she, she, she's poking at that. I think, I think Tony's point before, uh, exposing this type of, of thinking, this, this, this dissonance or trying to uncloud or uh, the dissonance that, 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 that runs rampant between the two communities. I think there's also, I think she also is targeting white middle-class Americans. The kinds of details she goes into about um, the killing of Amadou Diallo, um, you know, incidents like that. I think even the least in touch black person knows about. But she goes into, into almost journalistic detail about those atrocities. I think she is, she, I think she's targeting white people who live in majority white spaces who do not come into contact with black people um, frequently. I think, I, I think the fact that she, Lila, I think, is a character she believes will appeal to people from communities like that because Lila is, they will see the similarities between Lila and themselves. Um, for example, Lila feeling guilty um, or being made to feel guilty. I think that is something a white suburban woman, for example, would be able to identify with. In fact, I think Lila, honestly, I think Lila is, was sort of created to, for, for white suburban women to see the similarities between themselves and her. I think I think Lila is quite a complex character, but I don't want to um, take over the conversation. Um, I see, see, see uh, Kesawa, Kesawa, is there something you wanted to add to this? Yeah, I I found it really interesting what you said about Lila being a character that a white suburban middle class woman might in the U.S. might be expected to relate to, and I, I that's that that rings resonant and truthful for me. I guess the other question is, um, what do we think if of the absence of what feels like African-American women for me. That's something that jumped out. Um, the characters around Lila are Clive, um, the white lawyer, uh, who's a passionate civil rights advocate. Again, kind of in the 1950s form, but updated. I liked him though, I liked him, it was like his vibe. Um, there's also the fiance, Robert. Um, then she's got, got her, her colleague, Terence, who she respects immensely. Um, and for me, it felt like they are, the other characters apart from Lila, whose name's in the title, whose story we learn. But there's an absence of any black women in that space, right? Um, or any women at all. The only other woman I think is, um, what's the word? Her landlady, the old white lady, who's very nice, apparently. I don't agree with you. Um, no? I think Gail, Gail um, the, the, the lady who works in the bursar's office, I think she had um, a significant role. And certainly the sort of neo-villain, um, what was her name again? Elaine. Um, Elaine. The, Elaine. Elaine. I think Elaine was a significant character. Um, I, I, I agree that there was more interaction between Lila and, say, Terence. And, well, because um, Clive is a love interest, of course. Um, there would be significant interaction. I, I, to be, I'll put it on record that I could have lived without the love story. But, um, <laughs> but then um, Kesswa says that I am cold and hard. So, <laughs> Francine, I haven't heard in much this, from you. In this case, I think I, I, I don't think living without the love story. That love story was an issue. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not a fan of the love story. Francine, I haven't heard much from you. You want to come in here? Yes, I do. I kind of tried a couple times earlier. Um, I wanted to talk about the audience. I agree with you, Paula. I, I was surprised to hear Eric say that it's targeted to a Caribbean-American audience. 
I found not only did she spend a lot of time on the details of the, you know, the, the historical killings, but she spent a lot of time explaining things about the Caribbean. And Lila would say, oh, uh, this is what we call this on, our, on my island, or on my island we do this. And there were long paragraphs describing things on her island, which to me was not targeted to me because it's stuff, I think as a Caribbean person, even you know, second or third generation, there are certain things that you wouldn't have to explain to them in the context of the Caribbean. So yeah, that was that was basically it. I agree with Paula that the the audience was Americans, white Americans, maybe black Americans who don't have any Caribbean not knowledge of the Caribbean. But I wouldn't say it was targeted to Caribbean people in general. I think Paula. I think Erica was right though that um, Caribbean it's targeted at the Caribbean American community, who very often denigrate Africans African Americans. Ah, okay. Um, that point of view? Definitely, mm. I I think I think it was aimed at that community. Tony you wanted to come in. I just wanted to comment on that love story you're talking about, um, because I I just found it mildly amusing. I I don't want to dismiss it in the way you guys are dismissing it, you and Kessawa. But uh, <laughs> but there's Robert, who is, what, 2,000 miles away and is this controlling boyfriend. Even with the distance, um, he's certainly controlling her mind. So I think Professor Nunez wanted to have a, 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 a juxtaposed... Um, option, if you know what I mean. Um, something that um, Lila, or somebody rather, that Lila um, could maybe find some refuge in. And, and, so, and so there's this person who's physically present and um, pleasant, um, civilized, everything that Robert isn't, actually. Um, uh, and, and, and so maybe that's what was at play there. Um, was it a deliberate love story? I, I don't know. Um, but I, I felt that was a get back at Robert, you know, some sort of justice for the reader that, um, <laughs> that this controlling character 2,000 miles away is, is going to get horned. You know, <laughs> but everybody okay, was but... trying to control Lila, though. Her grandmother, grandmother. was trying to control Lila. Um, when she gets to the United States, um, Terence is trying to control her. Um, what I keep forgetting this woman's name, the neo villain. What's her name again? Elaine. Elaine, Elaine, Elaine. is trying to control Lila. Dr. Campbell is trying to control Lila. In fact, you, um, Raul J called her, called Lila naive. She, I, I don't know anybody that age who is so pliable in real life. Um, I don't know. It may be, maybe it may I be the live in a ship. I'm sorry? Kind of I said it might be the circles you move in because you're a strong character. No, I agree with Paula. That's one of the biggest problems that I had with the characterization of Lila. And it even goes back to touch a bit on what Kasawa was saying about her naivety in terms of the, you know, the racial situation in the U.S. I, I don't, I, I agree with Kasawa that some, a, a professor of Caribbean literature at what is presumably the University of the West Indies should be more aware. And this is some, this, this, these are, even, she was very much aware about Amadou, Diallo and she knew all of that, but yet somehow the other stuff has surprised her. And this is what the book was set in what 2017, right? Something like that. 2014. Before, 2014. Yeah. With that was um, Tamir Rice. So. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just I found it really hard to believe that a university professor in 2014 in a world of smartphones where everyone is connected would be that naive and also the whole thing with you know everybody controlling her like she literally didn't know what to think about anything I found that 
quite unbelievable actually especially for somebody who spent their whole time in think in thought like you're you're an intellectual like thinking is the day job so it's really odd like it's not like you know you work with your hands all the time and you never have time to think and so when you think you're mm. really you, you're talking so, to other so people let me, let me you know ask what i mean like question. you think for a job and also you you shape minds your job is to actually help other people develop critical thinking skills so how does that even really work mm. right plus she wrote this amazing essay about Caliban, right? And appropriation. Right. So, mm. yeah. So let me ask a question then. Given the level of consciousness that Layla should have with her academic background and the exposure to all this literature, and she herself is, is, is um, a person um, whose profession is, is literature, um, why would she be with somebody like Robert, who's clearly... Um, a moron, to be to be honest. Don't get me started on Robert, because I really do not get me started on Robert. <laughs> I think this is a good time to take. <laughs> Sorry, I think this is a good time to take the break for the reading. Um, you will hear from Elizabeth Nunes herself reading an excerpt from No Lila News. My name is Elizabeth Nunes. I'm going to be reading a short excerpt from my tenth novel. Now Lila knows. It doesn't need much of an introduction. Um, Lila is from the Caribbean islands and on her way to teach at this college in Vermont, she witnesses the fatal shooting of one of the black professors by the police. Here goes. It had only been two weeks since Professor Brown was killed. And it seemed as if collectively, the citizens of the town of Mayfield had amnesia. As Lila made her way down Main Street to the college, Mayfield appeared to her as the quintessential quiet New England village. One would be hard pressed, she thought grimly, to convince the reader and the stranger that just days before, long thick trails of blood had been scrubbed clean in front of the restaurant where a relatively young black man a professor at Mayfield College was shot dead by the police while astride a white woman who had OD'd on heroin. But what about the students? Had they forgotten too? Along the paved path towards the cafeteria, which was in the building directly opposite to the academic wing of the college, Lila saw no evidence that their attitudes had changed. As she was making her way to the cafeteria, she saw a banner. It was stretched across the wall of the entrance of the cafeteria next to the student notice board. Black Lives Matter, it said. The words were written in large black letters on a white sheet. Standing in front of the banner was a group of students, male and female, wearing black sweatshirts and hoods drawn over their heads. When she reached the top step, they stood at attention, one hand raised defiantly in a fist, Black Lives Matter, one of them ch chanted. Lila smiled nervously. What was she expected to do and to say? Was she to return their salute? She had seen other faculty pass through the door before her. The students had not saluted them. Was she part of us, part of the black faculty? The students stood in front of her. Black Lives Matter, they had recognized her. They had drawn her into their protest. She and she alone, not the white faculty who had entered the cafeteria just before her. Then she remembered a game she played as a child and the song that went with it. There's a brown girl in a ring, tra la 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 la. There's a brown girl in a ring, tra la 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 la. There's a brown girl in a ring, tra la 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 la. And she sweet like a sugar and a plum, plum, plum. On her island, she was a brown girl, sweet like a sugar on a plum, plum, plum. She had said to her fiance, Robert, back home, that she was black. Did that mean she was not a brown girl? That her nationality did not count? That it was more important to be black than to be a Caribbean woman? Her fiance had called her back later that night. So am I black too, he asked. 
In America, you are black if there's African blood in your ancestry, Lila answered. And what if there's more Caucasian blood, her fiancé asked. Lila was silent. So they will define me then? Is that it, Lila? I must abdicate my right to define myself, Robert said. Lila had no answer to give him. Welcome back. Um, now, I'm going to start off this, this segment of the program with a very controversial question. Is Clive the equivalent of Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird? And is he a white savior? Um, Kessa, what is finding is very amusing. So I'm going to ask her to answer the question. Oh, I can't. I'm laughing too much. Um, I love this idea that, yeah, I, it's, a, it's a very, very um, apt analogy. Obviously, Atticus Finch from Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, famous 1960s novel about the civil rights movement. Well, not about the civil rights movement, about injustice in 1930s Alabama, I think, Montgomery, something like that. I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact details. A lawyer who is often thought of as this righteous white man. Uh, and, and Clive certainly does feel very much like he could be a 21st century embodiment of that spirit of Atticus Finch. Um, a difference I think that's key that I think we have to mention is that Clive is also a love interest of a black woman, uh, a Caribbean migrant, uh, a university professor. And that is a, a new change that was, I think, impossible to imagine in the Gregory Peck film era before um, 1967's Loving versus Loving, right? I just, you can't see. And which is interesting because Atticus Finch was a widow, right? He could have had a black woman love interest, right? Um, I don't think- In the self? I mean, I'm just saying theoretically, like he wasn't- I mean, uh, they yeah. all did, they all did, but not, <laughs> not publicly. Not publicly, exactly, right? Or, or, or um, even, actually they did, even publicly, but it wasn't acknowledged, <laughs> so. <laughs> what I'm saying is, like, it's a different narrative when Clive Lewis can be considered a, a, a feasible love interest. But it's, not an, it's not a crazy proposition in this novel. It doesn't feel like, oh, that would never happen. At least it didn't for me. And I'm British. I, I, I've never lived in the US. So maybe that's a, a reach that Eric will be like, that's some nonsense. That would never happen. But I think we've seen more and more kind of US. I mean, in the UK, mixed race couples are not exciting. Like, they're very common and, and very, yeah, not interesting in the way that I think in the US there's a different sort of relationship, which is what Terence alludes to a lot with Ronald's crime being, you know, he dated and loved a white woman. Sorry, I, that's a long answer. I think but, it's an interesting question for that. He is, it, like it's such an interesting him. question. Give me a second. It's such an interesting question that I want to hear from the US resident. I was Eric, ask Eric, I'd I like you to exactly come in here. Happened. Please, please, is Atticus, uh, is, 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 um, what's his name? Clive, uh, Radiant, no, you the, the, the love Atticus. interest, whatever his name is. Right. Is he Atticus Finch? Is he a white savior? Uh, that's, that's a good question. In, interesting question. Uh, I, I never thought of him as, as an Atticus Finch type uh, of reading, reading through it, uh, probably because I haven't read uh, The Killer Mockingbird since, since high school. Um, so I didn't think about him in that in that sense. But and do I did I think about him or do I think about him as a white savior character? Not so because I think Clive Lewis he's he's more thoughtful than that. At least that's how he comes across to me. He knows he knows he knows he's a white man. He he knows his privilege and so forth and so on. And he had this experience that led him in his in his past life early life that led him to do the type of uh advocacy that 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 he does um does he slip up oh of course he does um i think i think he uh eroticize i'm sorry uh, <laughs> exoticizes and objectifies lila from the get-go which which i which made me cringe uh when when i read it and continued to make me cringe as the two had interactions um I don't know if that was Professor Nunez's point in that. I don't know. I, I would. That's a great question for for her to answer. But I don't see him as an Atticus Finch type. The I only agree. thing is that he's a lawyer. I agree um, with you. I thought he was an ally, and I thought he was a respectful ally. He knew that he he shouldn't be putting himself forward 
as a leader of the cause. He knew that he was supposed to play a supporting role. And I thought he was respectful. But of course, he made mistakes. But he also was aware of the fact that he would make mistakes. Um, so I, he was a decent character. Kessa, think, Kessa, you... Yeah, I just want to add one thing to that is that um, we can't, like we often think of Atticus Finch in the context of To Kill a Mockingbird. But when we think of the, the lost second novel or the pre-read or pre-sequel, Go Tell a Watchman, we discover that Atticus Finch is very much in line with the worst of the white bigots in the town that, you know, he, they live in in the South. You know, he's a member of the White Citizens Council. You know, he's, he's not uh, a white saviour by any stretch of the imagination in this sense. And I think he's quite different in that respect. And when you, and when you remember that part, there's no way that he's really climbing. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's a nice invocation of previous versions of characters like this, but I think it is clear that he's a different beast. Clive Lewis. Yeah, I agree. I agree there as well. Um, yeah, I think uh, as Paul and, and Eric mentioned, that Clive is aware um, of his role in the fight, and he's not trying to overstep the, the boundaries. I, I, I agree there. Yeah. I think. Sorry, just to come back again on this question of the white savior, I do think there is a white savior character, but I think that's the student. Yes, absolutely. That's what I was going to say. I was extremely annoyed by him. As good as he was, he just, he was just, he was too much. Like, <laughs> I just found that, I also found him quite unrealistic, like in the end. And he just, he had all the right answers for all the situations. And yeah, you know, yeah. And he, yeah, he was definitely a so favorite character. Well, I didn't find him unrealistic, actually. I, I wouldn't say I found him well, unrealistic. I yeah, him maybe I guess no? unrealistic because people like that actually do exist i suppose i should i guess i should say that i i he was he was he was just too much <laughs> tony wanted but to I come was, in no, but no i was just seeing him funny enough when i visualized him i was visualizing him as a as an m, &M the the white rapper who's <laughs> that's kind of almost thuggish um but but aligned with a black cause um that's I mean that's an aside, but that's 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 how I was kind of visualizing him, and I don't think that was the intent of uh, Professor Nunes. Um, but I, I agree that um, he was. I don't think he was trying to be a white savior. I, I think he was just trying to be, um, or was a conscious. Who was? It? Who is a he? Who is a the, he? The, the, the student. The student. The student. The M and M hoodie, hoodie um, character. <laughs> Right, I, I, I just saw him as being a young, um, articulate, conscious man of the times. Um, wanted to, you know, and I'm sure there are lots of white people like that in the United States because you see them on these protest marches and so on. And I don't think they're just doing it for, for some photo op. But um, I, I, I agree that that. There's probably sincerity, mm, but sincerity an ally, yeah. allies must know their place. Mm. Allies must not be trying to lead the fight. <laughs> and then, in as much as I have said the word fight, is this Lila's fight? Who wants to take that on? What, and none of you is brave enough I, to take I'm, it on? I'm brave enough. I'm brave Go enough. ahead. Um... Yes, it is. It is Lila's fight. Um, uh, even though some characters uh, in, in in the text want to want to ostracize her and say that no, this isn't her her fight. It's very much her fight. And I mean, this this is the underlying. It's it's an underlying theme in in the text, but it does it does percolate. It it does bubble up uh, toward the end when when Lila uh, speaks about. Um, I think the that when when she says she's a black professor, uh, not not just a professor, she's a black professor, because in that space she is a black professor. She is not simply some uh, literature professor from the Caribbean, even though for some folk that would seem more erotic. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna say erotic, exotic, <laughs> um, exotic, and 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 she's seen and she's seen differently, and and, and that 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 comes out in the text too. But yeah, she if, if she walks the streets and she she realizes when she was chasing down Steve, uh, would she be arrested because there's a black woman chasing down this 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 this, this white young man? So she knows, uh, she knows it's her fight. 
she's just caught between and betwixt Terrence's sentiments and assertions and Robert's uh, uh, sentiments and assertions as well. How well do you think this novel addresses... Paula, Paula before you move on to your next question, I think there is a a big point um, that Professor Nunes is trying to make with that very question, is it Layla's fight, right? And trying to show the character Robert, who clearly was um, saying, that's none of your business. Leave the Americans and let her get on with the business you don't know. And I, I think the author is making that point where we have these people here in the Caribbean of a certain class and so on that um, are famous for inaction. But why no action? Because they like to preserve the status quo. They're okay. They're okay in their space, right? And stop this thing about where you think you have you you've got to go and dabble in things that you don't need to dabble in. Um, don't upset the apple cat. And I think the author's trying to make this point um, as a strong point in, in in the book through that character Robert. Yes, I, th- I definitely that there. I don't think there's any doubt about it. But I think she was also speaking to the Caribbean American community, which even though they live in the United States, they live with all of the realities, still hold on to an, the illusion of privilege. So I don't think it's just us in the Caribbean she's speaking to, because I know these people, I know these Caribbean American people who still hold on to the illusion of privilege. And um, they say all the kinds of things that Robert says. And it's not just Caribbean Americans, because I've heard Africans who are first generation, uh, well, immigrant Africans who make similar statements. So I think it's a problem with immigrant blacks who, even if they know the history intellectually, somehow don't manage to know it emotionally. Is it because that they find themselves in a position of privilege? They, they've somehow escaped the, 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 the hardships, the rigors, having to hustle two jobs, two and three jobs, and, and have not maybe themselves experienced first and, you know, get to the back of the bus sort of thing. Um, is it because they're just putting up a wall and trying is it to... Re- also- is it perhaps also just the kind of self-preservation mode where if we deny our Afri- our, our link to the African-American struggle as black people, we get ahead and it's just pure self-preservation and self-interest and not, you know, we don't have to intellectualize it more than that. It's if I identify more as a Caribbean American person who doesn't have these links, then I also escape the prejudices that African-Americans face. I'm posing the question. I'm not assuming anything. Well, if I could jump in here, I mean, not not to sort of be an apologetic or anything, but uh, apologist. But the thing is, I guess for Caribbean people, uh, especially those born after 1940, all they knew were black leaders. In the Caribbean, we don't say, oh, he's the first black prime minister. We just say, oh, he's our first prime minister. Whereas in the U.S., they had to wait until 2008 to say we have our first African-American uh, president. So maybe in, a, in 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 some way caribbean people sort of misconstrue that to mean that they're somehow immune from the troubles of the world and the racism that they face when they go to uh the us or the uk for example but i think that's def- that that sort of uh, comfort is misplaced definitely but i'm not sure that all caribbean immigrants escape that i mean i think we had a brief discussion about you know different types of immigrants which is maybe something we want to get into some of them do but some of them are you know as tony said hustling with the two three four jobs and just existing just like regular immigrants and regular black americans and then there's lila with a very comfy job no, that's one thing that I struggle with in, in the text is I, I think there's this, some of the characters, and I, I again, I, I don't know what uh, Nunez's point was in, in the overall point, but there was this, this lack of uh, historical knowledge about the activism of Caribbean, Caribbean Americans 
in uh, civil rights and more radical uh, um, racial politics. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, first person that comes to mind is Marcus Garvey, but there's also Hubert Harrison uh, as well. Um, and, and there are others, and then there are others who are like second generation that we don't even we don't even think of as Caribbean Americans. Malcolm X. Exactly. And Shirley Chisholm. He's, he's mentioned in, in the book. Um, um, Eric, 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 what's his name? Um, the solicitor, for, right, former Solicitor General. Um, yeah, Eric Holder. Holder, right. Yeah. yeah. So, you know. But let me, let me go back to a question that we were, we kind of, we, we spoke about before. Robert. Um, Robert and Kenton, because we haven't spoken about Kenton yet. Which of these people um, do you think was a better partner for Lila? Kenton is for the, for the audience because they haven't know, they don't haven't read the novel. Kenton is the ex boyfriend that Lila was going out with before she got involved with Robert, and she was madly in love with him. Um, who wants to take that one on? Which of them is the, would have been a better partner for Lila? Tony, you're smiling. Tell me. Because the answer is very easy. Um, you know, Robert, there's nothing in there and, um, to me about Robert at all. Um, but I, I have to admit, Paula, I, I remember Kenton kind of vaguely, so I'm probably not very qualified to answer. But what I do, the little bit I remember, I think Kenton may not have been seen to be in the class that Lila... Um, was in and therefore that was the friction that was the area of tension um and so often we 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 see that being part of the dynamic but i just want to throw it out there for paula francine and kessel in particular i don't, I don't want to be really a question paula but you know a lot of professional women in the caribbean are hard pressed to find um, I'm very careful with my, my words because I don't want you all to chew my head off. But they're hard pressed to find men who other people would find acceptable for them. And if they go to the Kentons, they get criticized. Like, um, where's a big professor like Kesawa? Um, you know, going out with this um, fairly ordinary guy. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm just saying, don't shoot the messenger here. I'm just saying that <laughs> that is a dynamic. And I, I think that came out a little bit in the novel. Um, that is a Vincentian dynamic, Tony. Vincentian? It's a no, Vincentian. No, oh, so. oh, the so. no let, me, let me just clarify. Let me, I, because I know what Tony's talking about. Tony's talking about a class difference. Kenton, where they were in life when Kenton was going out, with Lila, they were they were equals at that point in in terms of socioeconomic position. At that point, they were equals. Kenton comes from a working class um, background, but he was a middle class professional when they were a couple. Kenton Kenton did not suit Lila's grandmother because he was too black. It's as simple as that. Yes, there was that. I, I what, give you that. What, I what give you that. Because I know this society and I know what Tony is talking about. What Tony is talking about is when women, um, upper middle class women, date men of a lower socioeconomic class. That is what Tony is talking about. Isn't it what you're talking about, Tony? That is oh, what we I'm understood talking. that. And that's okay. a Vincentian yes. thing. I, I don't, don't think, think it's Vincentian. Though. I don't think it's a Vincentian. No, no, thing. what I no, no, no. I will tell you why I think I'm saying it's a Vincentian thing. Tony started off the question by saying that there is a shortage of men. Um, and people say that, that across the that, Caribbean. That's why it's not a Vincentian thing. I don't I see it. I, I think it's a I don't see it happening thing. across the Caribbean. I yeah, think that's I, a Saint I, Vincent I thing. Definitely, I agree with Kesuan too. It's it's broad. I mean, I experienced it when I lived in Barbados. Paul is living here too long. I don't see it in Jamaica. I see. I hear about it in Saint Lucia. I hear about my yeah, cousins in Pitts. I've seen same. it. In, I've seen it in Guadeloupe. I've seen it in Martinique. Mm. It's a question that comes up again and again that you have these. And I've also heard it argued, and this is where some 
time poorly, you feel free to intervene. Um, I've also heard it argued that it's a cause sometimes of domestic violence because women choose men that are not of the socioeconomic background. There's a tension because she's doing well and he isn't. And that creates friction in the couple that can lead to situations of domestic violence. No one's blaming the woman in that case. But I've heard that said as well. No, I understand that phenomenon because I have seen that. But um, I don't think there's any... Sh I think the shortage of, of, of men of, this, of your middle class... Middle, educated middle class men is a Vincentian thing. I don't think, I don't uh, see it in Jamaica. I, I, maybe but maybe it's not in Jamaica, Jamaica but across the Caribbean, I've seen no. it. Yeah, maybe. Um, but but, but, but back, to back to my question. question. Yes. Sorry. Yes, yes. back to my question. Out, you did bring out something that I forgot. <laughs> you made the point about the grandmother, Lila's grandmother, finding Kenton not suitable. And I think you had the nail right on there. It's simply because he was too black. But the grandmother yeah. said so in so many words. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll suggest that as well. like, <laughs> that's not a deduction. <laughs> I, I do think that um, I agree with Tony that of the two, Kenton would have been preferable. But at the same time, I feel like he also would have been trying to control Lila because he really he wanted her to follow, basically follow his dreams and do what he wanted to do, like. There wasn't really any compromise in terms of what their future would look like. He decided that, you know, he was going to move to Africa, was it? And that was what she needed to do as well. And I think so, Kenton was also dismissive of her. Right. Um, he essentially, you know, said, basically, you're a bougie girl. You can't live the ki this kind of life. Um, I, I, I thought both of them were bad, would have been bad choices for Lila. But we have come to the end of the program. We've run no, out of no, time. No, we have a minute left. And I have her, all right, go ahead, Kesawa. One last thought. <laughs> I would like to ask very quickly how we feel about, I know I mentioned it earlier, the lack of women, but I think the reason why this question about who would be a better, better partner is because there's a lack of friendship in the story. There's a lack of female friendship and a lack of female characters. And I, I do think there's a masculine focus the plight of the black man is raised way too often and and you see a total absence of the question of african-american women but also women more generally am i the only person that feels that way you can do a little heads up shake your head or something but am i the only yeah person that i mean now that you mention it it's true lila didn't seem like she had any friends right she was back home it was her grandmother and robert that was it but surely you know she should have had female friends she should have been discussing all this stuff with her best friend Right? Yeah, like, that's hey, that's how I women met, that's hey, how I women this, operate. I, this, and, and, I yeah. just met this guy Clive and like wow, <laughs> but you know <laughs> And now I have to intervene to okay. stop you because you speak too much, all of you. Um thank you very much for joining us. When next you see us, we'll be having a conversation with the author of this novel, Elizabeth Nunez. Um she's a Trinidadian American writer. And she has some Vincentian connection. I'm sure she'll tell you about that when we see her. Thank you. Bye.